and welcome. Thank you for joining Marstream, your public broadcasting platform. Tonight, I'll be your host for Wildcard Tuesday for David Ford's creating and performing class. The Marsh has been offering nightly free programming and we'd like to welcome our YouTube viewers and Zoom viewers to become members, sustaining members, to visit our tip jar and to subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Marsh Stream, through our website, www.themarsh.org. So without further ado, please welcome David Ford, our solo performance guru, Marsh director, who will introduce his students for this evening's Wild Card Tuesday. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks a lot for coming to the Marsh, except of course, kind of isn't the Marsh. It's my living room. Mm -hmm. uh, let me adjust this so you can see the painting behind me. That's my, that's actually a painting of my great aunt, uh, oddly enough. Um, so I'd uh, like to um, just remind you that you're gonna be seeing some new work tonight. And we've been zooming in on um, Sundays and trying to figure out what it is that uh, we can say in this moment that um, will, you know, strike a chord for you. And, um, you know, we don't really know whether we've done that until you arrive, until you're here. Um, so um, I, I can see we're having some trouble getting the right spotlight here, but I'm going to keep talking. Um, so um, by the way, uh, what we're planning to do tonight is have a few people, there we are, have a few people who are unmuted so that we have a little bit of audience response for the performers. But um, Largely, most people we, I'm afraid, have to keep muted because I'm sure you've all been on Zoom meetings where that wasn't the case. It gets chaotic. But we would love to hear your responses. Um, and the best way to do that is through the chat. So if you have any thoughts, responses, feedback, please, uh, please go to the chat. And um, oh, we're, we're we're back in the, uh, we don't have the right spotlight. Um, there we go again. All right. <laughs> I mean, uh, as uh, last night, we uh, were working with a performer who was zooming in from Portland where they were having intense windstorms and we were all marveling that this ever works. <laughs> a little bit that like that, uh, uh, that comic, He Who Shall Not Be Named um but has a very funny bit about complaining about airlines when what airlines do is let you sit in a chair in the sky hurtling along at 500 miles an hour <laughs> why well like why do we ever expect that to work but um so along those lines why do we ever expect zoom to work why did it exist at all for this in any event, um, we're gonna do something a little different in our formatting tonight. We have three performers who are doing uh, longer form pieces, 15 to 20 minutes. And then we have a fourth performer, A.D. Abbott, who's gonna be doing some shorter pieces in between the longer pieces. Um, and you'll uh, also see that uh, if you forget the title of the piece, it'll come up right before right at the end so that you can check in and remind yourself of who and what you've been watching. And uh, at that, I would like to start the show uh, by introducing our first performer, Sharon Eberhardt. I first realized I could be a spy when I was six years old sitting at the family dinner table, waiting to share some big news. That day, I had been chosen to take the chalk dust filled blackboard erasers to the custodian's office to be cleaned. I watched as he put an eraser 
on a big machine and pushed a lever, kathunk, it turned on a vacuum that sucked all the dust out of the eraser. And then he let me put the next eraser on the machine. Kathunk, I really wanted to share my news, but as the youngest of four kids, I had to wait for a break in the conversation. <laughs> and as I <laughs> said, somehow I realized I didn't have to tell my news. <laughs> I could keep it secret. I had never had a secret before, except when I did something bad and lied to hide it. But that felt bad and guilty. <laughs> And this felt good, powerful. I knew something none of the other five people at the table knew. It was like being a spy. They sneak around gathering mm. information and spies lie for good reason to protect the innocent or stop evildoers. Spies were always really good looking, well-dressed and very fit. Oh, maybe some of that will be out of my reach. <laughs> but I could do the code part. Faye, uye, irhe, is they, azre, orhe, and anyone? That's pig Latin for if you hear this, raise your hand. <laughs> I rocked pig Latin in middle school. A friend and I got books from the library on American Sign Language, and we would send messages to each other behind our desks during class or openly during recess or lunch. I even ended up teaching Sunday school to a boy who used sign language for two years, which was a stretch since I didn't really get the religion thing. Or yeah. <laughs> wasn't fluent in sign language, but spies, <laughs> spies do that kind of thing, getting in situations over their head. <laughs> Julius Caesar, the emperor of Rome, used a substitution code to send messages to his generals during battle. You, for each letter, A goes into D, B to E, you're just moving it three spaces along. So, if you want to say cab, it becomes F D E. It's a simple code if you know the key, but if you don't, it looks like gibberish. And Caesar died in 44 BCE, but the code kept going. The Roman Empire, Empire fell, but the code lived on. And the next great empire, the Islamic Caliphate based in Baghdad around 800 CE, Al-Kindi was a translator and mathematician. The caliphate was translating the great works of the Greeks, Romans, Persians, Hindus, and Chinese in Arabic. Al-Kindi read the use of Hindu numerals, like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, which we know as Arabic numerals because Europeans learned them from Al-Kindi, he said, for him who speaks the truth, there is no greater reward than truth itself. Now, I don't know what it's like to translate Persian, Sanskrit, or Mandarin, but in middle school, I took Latin, and I can say it's sometimes frustrating, You're translating, and, and some words you look up, and it's like, honor, honor, versus, against, but other words, oak in the dictionary, quercus, oak, acorn, garland, wood, staff, or oar. You go back and, and just change words around and try to find the combination that works moving things until finally something makes sense. Okay. 
his honor shown by means of a garland on his head. It was like being a detective trying to solve a mystery. I got better at it with practice, getting to know the structure. But Al-Kindi was such a good translator, the caliph hired him to tutor his sons. Al-Kindi taught them the structure of the language, the patterns, how in classical Arabic, some letters are more common. This is true of all languages. In English, E is the most common letter. The most common two letter pair is TH. The only one letter words are I and A. Al-Kindi was passionate about the subject and tried to translate the passion to his students who might not have been as interested. Did he start a game telling them about letter frequency and challenging them to make a code that he couldn't crack? Try to stump the teacher? Well, they couldn't. No matter what code they made, scrambling letters, Alkindi always found the key. And perhaps the caliph, their father, overheard this and asked Alkindi to help him make and break codes as the caliphate was battling to expand into Europe. Alkindi wrote a book on deciphering cryptographic messages. It contains the first known cracking of the Caesar Code 800 years after it was developed. And Alkindi's frequency analysis is the basis of all cryptography making and breaking codes, including complex substitution ciphers where letters go through more than one substitution or get turned into, letter, into numbers or rearranged into columns or zigzags. And a code can be any, any set of symbols, one if by land, two if by sea. In a Sherlock Holmes story, the dancing men, criminals send messages with little symbols as Sherlock Holmes realizes that each dancer's position corresponds to a letter of the alphabet. And that's how he solves the puzzle, the crime. Now, in 1837, Samuel Morse invented the telegraph, which could send electrical pulse across long distances on a wire. To send language, he made a code of long and short pulses, which would fit each letter or number. Dit, 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 da, 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 that's SOS. They taught telegraph operators to listen to the Morse code like a language and write it down. The Navy only recently stopped teaching all sailors Morse code, but it's still used. In 1892, Elizabeth Smith was born in Indiana to a family of farmers. She saw her mother get worn out raising nine children and she didn't want the same thing. She wrote in her diary, I am never quite so gleeful as when I am doing something labeled as ought not. <laughs> am I normal? Why should something with a risk in it give me an exuberant feeling inside? She tried teaching, but wanted other work. And in 1916, she went to the Newberry Library in Chicago to see their copy of the first folio of Shakespeare's plays printed in 1623. She wrote in her diary, she had the feeling like an archeologist must have, realizing he has discovered the tomb of a great Pharaoh. She asked the librarian if she knew of any jobs in research or literature. I'd like something interesting. Well, an eccentric millionaire had recently <laughs> set up a think tank outside Chicago. And one of the projects was proving 
that the plays of William Shakespeare were not written by the obscure actor and son of a glove maker, but were in fact written by the wealthy, educated Francis Bacon, who had hidden secret codes inside the plays. Bacon had invented a code that could be hidden in plain text and their boss, Elizabeth's new boss, believed that you could read secret messages based on which letters in the folio were capitalized or italicized. Elizabeth worked trying to find the code, but she couldn't see it. She didn't like pussyfooting around the truth and she told a coworker William Friedman, who shared her doubts. They confronted their boss, but she assured them that the code was there. Should Elizabeth keep looking for a code she didn't believe in just to keep her job? Well, this was 1917 by now, and the US was getting drawn into World War I. Germany was promising Mexico to give them back some land the U.S. had taken years ago. If Mexico would side with Germany, the U.S. didn't have any spies to monitor Mexico. There was no CIA, no NSA, and most of our spies the government did have had been fired by an official who believed it impolite to read other countries' mail. Yeah. <laughs> Elizabeth's boss offered their team of code breakers to help the army. The army sent some messages as tests and Elizabeth got to work. They were sets of numbers, sometimes letters. She hadn't found the coded messages in Shakespeare, but Elizabeth tried looking. The stakes were high now. In college, I took Latin poetry. I do home, homework at night, moving words around, trying to get in the poet's head, foreign fabric where lover of me show. Oh, that's enough for me. <laughs> but the next day in class, the professor calls on me to read my translation. The adrenaline pushes me awake. I look thin foreign silk. My mistress wears, reveals the stuff of my dreams. Mm -hmm. That is what the poet means. My face is red hot. Now sweat is dripping down my back. And that's just poetry. <laughs> Elizabeth was dealing in people's lives. She used frequency analysis to convert number pairs into letters. She made a table, a chart, sorting out likely matches. Then she checked a Spanish dictionary, looking to see if any of her matches fit real Spanish words. She called it the thrill of your life. The skeletons of words jump out at you and make you start. She gave her decryptions to her friend William and he confirmed the results. They knew they weren't just making it up like their boss was with the Shakespeare codes. The army sent more messages, some made with grids of letters and numbers. Some had code numbers multiplied had the code numbers multiplied by a key number or a pin number added to each set of numbers to try to hide it. Elizabeth and William used trial and error to crack the codes. Then they, each time they broke a code, they documented it so they could use that method again. They taught cryptography to army officers being sent to France. And Elizabeth and William got married. The army wanted to send him to France to train officers, and he asked to take Elizabeth since they were a team. But the army said no. For the first time, she felt like they weren't equals. 
she was still solving codes, but he was now crack making codes and getting promoted, getting known. He wrote her a letter from France using a rail fence cipher. You don't mix up the letters, you just write them. I love you very much. After the war, they moved to Washington, D.C., and, and Elizabeth quit her army job. She thought she was done with codes. They had two children, and she stayed home raising them. Then in 1927, a knock came on the door from a Coast Guard officer. They asked Elizabeth's help deciphering messages sent by run rummers rum runners trying to break po prohibition laws. After years at home with the children, Elizabeth was ready for a change. <laughs> she broke the codes of the rum runners. A ship of alcohol would anchor off the U.S. coast, then send radio messages to small boats on the shore. The boats would go to pick up the rum, whiskey, Elizabeth deciphered the codes so Coast Guard ships could go and stop those boats. By 1931, she was cryptanalyst in charge of the US Coast Guard. She was passing along deciphered messages to the FBI so they could catch criminals. Elizabeth testified in a trial against a smuggling ring that included Al Capone. She broke a heroin smuggling ring financed by Joseph Kennedy. The trials brought attention. Some of the smugglers threatened her life. Elizabeth was interviewed by a newspaper and she said, we have to keep our ideas secret so we do not give other smugglers any new ideas. Deciphering based is Deciphering is based on what we call the mechanics of language. There are fixed ways in which a language operates. Elizabeth and William socialized with friends from work. Each always credited the other with being the brains of the family. Though he said hers was more based on women's intuition. But they felt they worked best when they worked together. Once Elizabeth left some work out at home and William picked up and teased out a message. Tell Captain Arno's wife, send new shoes, size 13. <laughs> William's work for the army was classified now, so he couldn't talk about it. And then in 1938, Elizabeth started getting messages the Coast Guard had gotten from South America. With frequency analysis, she could tell they were in German. Nazi agents were tracking American ships that were taking supplies to Europe for France and England. The Nazi spies were sending the information so submarines could target those ships at sea. Elizabeth called it exciting round the the clock adventures, racing to crack the codes so that the American ships would not be hit. But now neither she nor William could talk about their work. On the day that his team cracked one of the most important Japanese codes, she said he came home, asked what's for dinner. Maybe they talked about their kids, a girl at college and a son at boarding school, or just about the food and the weather. I remember the moment I realized I'd never really be a spy. I was in college and I'd gone to Russia, to Moscow, to study Russian. My first day there, I called a friend of a friend from college who wanted to trans to transfer currency, and we met at a party of literature grad students. I came back and I told my American roommate, I had said in Russian, Nie dumaya, što u ženšine duši? 
don't you believe that women have souls? I was so excited because somehow the work in my head of translating and speaking in Russian had overcome my natural shyness. The people there couldn't tell I was normally timid and quiet. It was like I had found a secret identity. But my roommate said she wouldn't meet any regular Russians because it might hurt her security clearance when she tried to join the foreign service. What's the point of study abroad if you're not going to meet people? You may as well stay at home. I had a complex social life by the end of the summer, See, seeing plays with an American friend, hanging out with another American and, and two Russian engineers her boyfriend had met the year before. A, a Ukrainian couple was taking me to political manifestatsi. I met poets, musicians. Maybe I would have liked getting a government job for the Foreign Service or NSA, but I wanted to connect to people, not to be walled off. Spies are looking for bad things. I wanted to find the good. Elizabeth knew that William wasn't sleeping. When she took their daughter on vacation, he wrote a letter saying, I wish I could write about forbidden subjects. What a story could be told. When Pearl Harbor happened, William knew the Japanese codes. They could tell a battle that some kind of attack was coming, but not where it would happen. He wrote in his diary that his feelings were the heebie-jeebies, and he felt the schizophrenia of cryptography, having information you can't use to save one group because it might hurt another. The stress and secrecy became too much for William and one day without telling Elizabeth, he drove himself to the hospital and checked himself in for nervous exhaustion. But she nursed him, helped him and he went back to work, but it happened again. But Elizabeth kept working. She had chosen and unusual, interesting life, and it might be hard, but it was hers. She cared for William now that his mind, which had unlocked so many secrets, was a code neither of them could crack. Elizabeth was asked to lead cryptography for the Office of Strategic Services, which became the CIA. She set up and trained the whole CIA's code operations. When the war ended, William went to Germany to interview Nazis and then he helped set up the NSA, an auditorium at the National Security Agency is named for him. Elizabeth retired and, and she cared for William as his health declined. Her name faded from view until women at the CIA, FBI, started going through records looking for code-breaking pioneers. Declassified files were open showing how it was her decryptions that the FBI had used to solve so many crimes. Elizabeth's name was added to the auditorium at the NSA, and the NSA sent someone to take an oral history of Elizabeth in the 1970s. She said, there are plenty of mysteries you can leave dangling. She knew the most successful code breaker is the least known. She and William knew what they had done. They were connected by secrets and a search for the truth. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. I got one question today. Just one. <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with people? <laughs> Most of us have been able to wrap our heads around the whole no shirt, no shoes, no service thing, right? 
and why? Because no one wants to see your sweaty man tits or smell your fucking feet, right? <laughs> a consideration. No, it's, a, it's an expectation, a demand for consideration of other fucking people. Why is that so hard? Why is it we can't wrap our heads around a fucking mask? Or better yet, wrap the mask around your fucking head. I can't believe people are fighting this. Really. This is the hill you're going to die on? I can tell you, this is not the hill I'm dying on. I was just trying to get some groceries for fuck's sake. And I see this no mask just freaking out on this poor guy because he won't let her in the store. Otherwise known as doing his job. And she's just going at him like he's the deep state in fucking Carnet, saying how they're all in on this conspiracy to silence people like her. I had to stop. I said, lady, look, no conspiracy here. I am all about your silence. Please, <laughs> shut the fuck <laughs> up. <laughs> red sheep and says, don't think they're not watching you too. Are you kidding me? Of course they're watching me. I don't put a thing past our government, even before the Cheeto and fucking Chief started this nightmare joyride. Yeah, they're watching me. Does that mean I gotta be an asshole to the poor schmuck guarding the door at Whole Foods? No. And yeah, I shop at Whole Foods. Fuck you, they got good produce. Look, <laughs> bottom line, wear the fucking mask or stay the fuck home. Why? For the same reason you put on pants, because this is a civilized fucking society. What? I'm on the goddamn computer. Oh, can you give me five minutes? I asked for five minutes. I can't believe you can't even give me that. <laughs> it's like I can't even say anything anymore. <laughs> and try to do something about it. I'm going to be crucified. <laughs> I have feelings, okay? I have a right to get what I ordered and to receive good customer service. <laughs> I mean, the guy that I mentioned that I specifically asked for extra foam. <laughs> special treat. Did I freeze? <laughs> Since the shelter in place, I don't get to have my cappuccino every morning like I used to. I, we've all had to get up a lot. <laughs> my thing. So, uh, uh. <laughs> I'm lucky if I have it once every week or two. Anytime I go grocery shopping or to run some other essential errand, I make sure to stop by my local Starbucks to get my cappuccino with extra food. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, is it wrong? <laughs> but if I say anything, no matter how politely I say it, as soon as they hear that my name is Karen, I get that look. My name is Karen, okay? <laughs> it doesn't make me a Karen. And I just wish people could respect my... <laughs> <laughs> So I got a question for you, and it's important, so listen up. Did you wake up this morning in a free country? Think about that carefully. Did you wake up in a free country? I did. And what's more, I woke up proud to live in a free country, the only place in the world where with a little hard work and perseverance, a person can truly be whatever they want to be. That's the country I grew up in, and it's the country I will defend from the liberal elites who are now trying to take away my freedom to breathe. How dare you infringe on my most basic right. It's right there in the Constitution. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Breath is life, but now they want to take away I want to slap a mask over my nose and mouth and take away my breath, my liberty, and I'm sure as heck not happy about it. Oh, 
too. And it's no coincidence that those masks, those death rags, are also taking away our right to speech. <laughs> they are to silence us. Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> You think the snowflake cries every time someone touches their face? And I haven't washed my hands today. Take that, Pelosi. <laughs> so I can't breathe and I can't speak in public. Oh, their solution is to stay home. Visit your family and friends on Zoom, they say, where they can monitor our conversations. They are listening. Are you not seeing this? Ba ba, don't be a blind sheep. And you can kick me out of your elitist Whole Foods. And you can tell me to shut the F up. But I will not be intimidated. And I will not be silenced. It's <laughs> 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 A106 sheltering in place. You know what they say, right? You cannot outdo black people. I, for one, I'm literally in my living room, seated, big booty to yoga block, waiting to join a live virtual drumming circle in the woods. The Redwoods in Oakland, California. Because memory, where I really wish I was, Harlem, New York City, Mount Morris Park, Jazzmobile, an African dance class, a kid squeezing, tightly holding my mother's hand. Because pandemics and discomfort the gentle touch of mother's hands. Like you, I'm only human. I've been forgetting, looking outside myself for answers, for meaning, for comfort. It's second nature for me, forgetting the answers. They're inside me. There's power in these hands. These fingers are my late father's. The palms are all mama. It's all good. I'm doing what I've always done. What African people, whether born in Brazil, Angola, or Detroit, have always been doing. I'm improvising. <laughs> what am I doing? That's COVID Bay, Dwayne, my <laughs> latest crush. I've known him for about a year, but we just started talking like a week ago. He's shiny, loud, dark chocolate, like 1987, 88, and I'm talking on my mama's phone. I'm in the middle of something. I think I'm gonna leave it right there. I'm so not interested. And you clowning on me today? Check this out. So I ran the tape all the way forward. And you know what? <laughs> this right here, it's not happening. I see Scarface, the ending. It's me <laughs> and you, Black Tony Montana and Michelle Pfeiffer. <laughs> so Wayne, if people were drugs, you would be Coca-Cola. <laughs> okay, you cannot beat the feeling. You know what I stay away from, right? Powder and drink. Yo, can I tell you one of my father's favorite phrases? More like my favorite phrase of my father? Yeah, what's that? First though, I want you to know I was gonna invite you to coffee or lunch earlier today. But I got caught up with Kevin and man, he's such a sweet kid. Yo, for real, for real? You never thought about kids? I know plenty of dudes done tried knocking you out. 
you for real, for real childless, just out here in these streets walking around, child. Is this a red flag? <laughs> you know I'm trying to do better. <laughs> Did you not just hear me? Were you not listening? Are you asking me out on a date? <laughs> yeah. Why? Um, I don't do coffee dates. I reserve coffee for, coffee for me is about recovery. If you want to ask me out on a date, I do lunch or dinner, not coffee. <laughs> so, yeah, like I was saying, my father, one of my favorite phrases of his, niggas and flies, I do despise. The more I see niggas, the more I like flies. <laughs> That's good. So what you're saying is your time is worth more than a $5 latte at Starbucks. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> no. He just would have said niggas and flies. This was Papa's equivalent of thumbs down. Shorthand for all things nonsensical, trifling, and black. In other words, hollow and contrived. Not so deep. And wrote woke. Hold on a minute. The host is letting me into the drumming circle. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. <laughs> it's less uncles in Mount Morris Park. Although funny. One of the co host name is Aikwe, like Arma. I wonder if he knows who he's named after. Probably not. Why are we so blessed? One of Uncle Aikwe's first novels is dedicated to me. He suggested my parents have a baby, you know, to save the marriage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, pardon me while I put on my coffee and board this plane back to 1989, the number, another summer. <laughs> That too looks just like speech, only heavier. Oh my God. Aikwe, I challenge you to a game of horseshoes. <laughs> this is, I might as well be on an extra in an Arrested Development or Exclaim <laughs> video circa 89. <laughs> Yo, the so all of us, them and me, we're doing way too much. Hmm. You know what Papa would have said, right? Niggas and flies. Let me hit you right back. The thing I'm not telling you about is starting. I might tell you about it later, but good. You think I'm going to judge you. Then I'm going to think you're reckless or something. I'm attracted to you. You know secrets that would get people like us into trouble, right? Yeah, I got it. Secrets get us into trouble. But to Wayne, the event is starting. I got to go. Talk to you later, okay? Bye. Secrets? Whatever. Dwayne don't know nothing about these hands. It worked. Here's something you should probably know. Growing up, the anti-apartheid movement was my rival sibling. Fall 1987. It's been four years since I've seen my father. Before that, seven. 1976, the year of Soweto, birthday number seven, and divorce. Misguidedly, I learned movements, second wives and children. South African, sons and daughters of Durban, Mafi King or Soweto, fluent in Zulu, Setswana and Kosa. They matter. My mother, born in Arkansas, raised in Oakland, a product of America's great migration. I Born in Manhattan, St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital, 
an English speaker with limited Tswana proficiency? Okay. I? Do you know what happens to little girls who think they don't matter? <laughs> Abandoning themselves freely comes easy. <laughs> what this looks like for me in the fall of 87, same as it always does, noble. I take off my first semester of college to travel with my father because the sweet taste of nostalgia, Coca-Cola, Cocaine, you cannot beat the feeling. Bob is at the height of his drinking career in touring the United States, a representative of the African National Congress of South Africa. It's like old times, a father-daughter reunion tour. I'm his sidekick and point person in every city, what you will call a road manager. Nostalgia and affairs, these are my first ties. We're at Conn College in New London, Connecticut. Edwin, an English major, trini, lanky, and funny, a dude I've been messing with all summer who got a girlfriend who goes to Georgetown. If relationships had theme songs, ours would have been Olivia Newton-John, let's get physical, physical, mm -hmm. the B-side, Nina Simone's cover of Just Like a Woman. And she makes love just like a woman and she aches just like a woman and she breaks. How? Just like a little girl. So Edwin, he's in the audience. It's full of undergrads, 18, 19, 20 and 21 year olds babies, mostly white. I don't remember what this one kid asked, but <laughs> I wish she hadn't. Here's Papa at the podium. I represent the people of South Africa. We are not accountable to Israel to Britain or the United States of America. The room is dead quiet. I'm embarrassed, but not ashamed. I mean, he was right, right? <laughs> but you know what else is true about this moment? Huh. I was lightweight terrified. During this trip, my father's anger is invasive and cutting. Before 87, that my father was a drunk never bothered me. I loved him no matter what. During this trip though, I experienced him meanly. That's the man he was at the time. Disillusionment for distant fathers and daughters is, or at least in my case, deadly. A killer, insidious, and spiritual. But mommy taught me well, so I sit upright, straightening my posture, eyeing the room, looking for Edwin, a possible lifeline to see which camp, whose side he's in. Nothing. We're at an uncle's house in Boston. Papa asked me to iron his shirt. It's red, cherry red and juicy. And I'm ironing my father's shirt. I'm not the ironing type, but I do so with pride. I'm finished. Here, Papa. Ah, 
Mama, you are useless. You wouldn't last a minute in the camps. Camp Menacing, Aunt Tamu, Happy Camper, Camp Auschwitz, The Something in the Poem, Refugee Camp, Plantation, Slave Ships, Steel Cups, Famine Lines, Late Night Television, Feed Family in Africa, Flies, Military, Samafko, Solomon Mathlangu, Freedom College, Double Stories, Double Bind, Secrets, Like Mom and Cancer, like Sean, rape, secrets, disconnected, amplifies that we are disconnected. <laughs> Never mind the idea of irons in a camp. And Auntie once tells me a story of her ironing in the camps. I realize camp is a euphemism, is a myth in some parts of the world like happy endings. <laughs> what the trip reveals is our disconnect. Me and Papa, yet I'm falsely pretending otherwise. No one can save me from disconnect. Equating disconnect with death, which it is, but really change. Do I look like an awning with the word dry cleaner stamped on my forehead? <laughs> <laughs> I run out of the room crying. My auntie and uncle do nothing. That Coca-Cola feeling, it's a fantasy, huh? The students at Kong College, they were dead quiet minus maybe a few Snickers. I'm not sure which came first, Boston or Connecticut. This is new, the meanness. Strangely though, it's one of my, also one of my favorite memories. That moment of Papa fired up on the podium at Kong College captures one of my favorite qualities about him. Uncompromising and unapologetic AF. <laughs> Niggas and flies. Mm. His wives and children suffered. But hey, who among us isn't suffering from some kind of hurt or pain inflicted upon us by a parent, wounded, doing their best in the middle of our growing up. Oh, I'm the only one? <laughs> okay. There's another memory I have from this trip. Bob was on stage at Riverside Church in New York. Tonight, He's shown up softer and gentler. Here, he's my main man. But I'm supposed to be a poet, so I'll read you a few poems. But before anything else, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of my daughter here, Ipileng Kozitsile. Aha, we all come from there. As even James Brown knows, it's a man's world, unfortunately. But without the woman, he wouldn't be a damn thing. The crowd applauds. That's all I ever wanted. Acknowledgement. Hmm. My father's allegiance. This is what becomes of little girls who think they don't matter. You know what? Fuck Coca-Cola. Day 110. Blood, let's circle back a minute. 
Childless? Ouch. That's a tool I picked up in therapy. Texting words, putting pen to paper, that part I got down. Speaking them out and aloud, that's different. Like when Dwayne called me childless, I was thinking, damn, really? Childless? <laughs> this constant obsession about what people are without. I think it's a sickness specific to the West. I have brothers, sisters, loved ones, a nephew. Uh, I got hands. I build things. My pride and joy. These turquoise shelves in my bathroom, sanded, painted, drilled into studs, and hanging on the wall by me. I like to think it's because my granddaddy was a carpenter. It's January. I'm getting ready to go to South Africa. It's my nephew Moya's seventh birthday. Like most people, I have rituals before leaving town. My home has to be clean and tidy for my return, a place to hold everything new I'll likely be carrying from the road. Fabric, a new outlook. It's almost like pre-travel. I'm cleaning my brain, wiping away older versions of myself, cleansing my spirit of chaos and disorder. I'm wiping the slate clean, laundry, dishes, vacuuming, changing sheets, cleaning every nook and cranny of the bathroom, including my shelves. The return from South Africa to the States, it's disorienting. I need order on my return. My home clean and tidy and reeking of fabuloso a day or so before I leave. It's comforting. I feel grounded. It feels like home. Not something alien like childless. <laughs> Maybe it's cultural. I'm part of a village, global, parents, aunties, uncles, sisters, brothers, prayers from people I don't even know, family, biological, extended. This is a worldview, an outlook. I believe firmly rooted in exile. Is this a red flag? Yeah. <laughs> 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 As always, we begin by beaming love at one another. <laughs> mm, that's nice. <laughs> Thank you all for being in my garden, this new virtual garden we're all learning to love. <laughs> learning to love, you know, that is quickly becoming one of my new favorite phrases. It's like a hero's quest. All roads lead to love. <laughs> and you know, the less likely it seems, the more fun I have finding my way there. I've been making it into a game. <laughs> it's like a dessert after my gratitude journals. A dessert <laughs> I can eat all day long without <laughs> feeling guilty. Try it for yourself. What can you learn to love today? Maybe it's being a homebody or more time with the kids, eating canned goods, whatever it is, I encourage you to have some fun with it. <laughs> <laughs> Shit! <laughs> <laughs> uh.
<laughs> Sometimes I get really stressed out that I don't think I could handle being tortured. <laughs> I know. So rando, but it really stresses me out. Like, seriously, don't trust me with any state secrets or whatever, because <laughs> as soon as they wheel in the dental tools, I'm spilling all the tea. Yeah. <laughs> I can't even look at it. Like, I'm a huge horror fan, but I can't watch any body horror. Not if it's at all realistic. It's safe, you know? Like, remember that scene in the first Pet Cemetery when that evil zombie baby kills Fred Willard? And he's like, oh, wait. Not Fred Willard. <laughs> Not Wilford Brimley. <laughs> Whatever he is, he comes in with a knife because he knows the baby is evil, and he's all, "Come on out, I got something for you." And then the evil baby just laughs, like. <laughs> and then uh, Fred Willard goes to look underneath the bed, and then the zombie cat distracts him. And when he turns away, you see this little hand come out from under the bed with a scalpel and just slowly cut. Achilles tendon. And then not Fred Willard or whoever he is goes, oh! and then as his mouth is open to scream, evil zombie baby cuts across it with the scalpel and splits the sides. And then he falls to the floor and evil zombie baby jumps on him and starts tearing at his throat with his teeth. I wish I could remember the name of that actor. <laughs> Bed. Hmm. Sanford. <laughs> anyway, the point is that even though I haven't seen it since I was a little kid, it still bothers me, like in my body. I think I just have a really high level of um what's that word? Empathy. <laughs> I'm so, if you're wondering about any of the products that I'm using today, be sure and click on the link in my bio and be sure and buy directly from the link because you get a discount and I get the credit. Thank you. Oh, you both. Oyibo, come, look, I have things. Yes, yes, what you want, Oyibo? Everything I got. In Nigeria, you never hear the Mexican beat vendor. Come, look, look is free. Price never comes up because in Nigeria, I have privilege spelled out in the word Oyibo, white lady. Oyibo elevates me implies price is no object. The game is just to get me looking. My hair is braided. I'm wearing Nigerian dress, but my skin and probably my Bruno Mogli sandals give me away. Her handwoven bath blanket is festooned with a hide and skin menagerie. Zebras, warthogs, rhinos, all about the size of steep miniatures could look exotic on my teak bookcase back in New Haven. Yes, yes, stick giraffe. Giraffe strong, long neck, like beautiful woman. Giraffe living family, so take baby too. Oh good, yes, now you need granny, you know? Just like Africa, the women, they strong, put family together. Yes, now you need a mile too. No, no, not two, just one. More wives, okay, but men, no. Too much fighting on Ibo, too much trouble. Oh, good. You like hippo? Lion? Okay, okay, just giraffe family. Okay, where are you from? United States. Ho, oh, ho, United States. Nixon, ha, <laughs> ha. You like your president, Nixon? Uh, well, actually, no, I don't. A lot of us don't. I did not vote for Nixon. Ooh, you say that out loud? 
but he is your president. Big landslide, biggest ever. No, we black people didn't vote for Nixon. You black people, oh, oh, honey, boy, you funny. You're not black. In America, I am. <laughs> Don't try to fool me. I black, she black, they be black. But you, <laughs> you white. But it's okay, Onibo. I like white people. <laughs> I don't like Nixon, but I like you. <laughs> you have money. You spend money is good. But <laughs> okay, Onibo, who want to be black? Okay, okay, okay. I give yes. you special price, and you take home African family. Okay. Hey. Maybe you want zebra too. Belly white, stripe of black, black on white. You like that? <laughs> I bought one zebra too. <laughs> <laughs> My roots trip, three years before the miniseries, inspired by a required clinical clerkship after my first year in medical school. Outside the US, much more hands-on experience. A faculty member had a connection at Lagos Island Maternity Hospital. 13,000 births a year. So guaranteed deliveries for me, including that summer, three sets of twins and a set of triplets. And besides, most of us were kidnapped and sold from West Africa. It would be more than 40 years before I learned that in fully half my African ancestry is Nigerian. But that summer, I had lived with all the privileges of white skin. I was never late to a meeting. No meeting started until I arrived. I didn't have to wait for a man or anyone else to repeat my words for them to be heard. Mm. I spoke, people listened. Other than street vendors, people greeted me with great deference. I lunched and swam daily at the country club, was invited to salons, book signings, cocktail parties. Well-educated and exotic, I was a trophy. Evidently, so were my shoes. At summer's end, at her request, I left them with the head nurse, along with two outfits requested by the next two in line. Good morning, Dr. Kuti. Dr. Barnes, the downside of privilege in an otherwise all black institution. Good morning, Nurse Tony. Where shall we start this morning? East Wing, very full today. How many new admissions? 25. Eight fetal demise. Three we are inducing now. Three ruptured uterus. Arm out, leg out, of us ignorant village people. Worst one walk three days. Baby way dead long before she even start. Anyway, they're in the OR schedule. Four retained placentas. The residents are working on those now. 12 septic. And how much penicillin today? Enough for seven. Any other antibiotics? Not today. We checked the port. Shipment cleared customs, nothing left. Now, my attending likely knew that. No matter who ordered the meds or paid the invoice, private clinics skimmed from the top, leaving little for the large public hospital. And every doctor in the hospital also ran a private clinic. <laughs> anyhow, most of them are from up at river. Too many of them anyhow. Rounds begin in a large partitionless room, three metal beds three feet apart. The mothers of dead baby wing. Sad, bright yellow eyes peer from below most sheets, jaundiced. Malaria, hepatitis, overwhelming infection. Other eyes are so white, even though many are chronically anemic from nutrition, these had to be hemorrhaged. I never before saw anyone alive with a hemoglobin below six, 12 to 15 being normal. 
But here they are, in droves, temperatures spiking, belly swollen, tender, pace, faces pained, desperate, resigned. Quick look at the chart, press of the belly, then next. Doctor, you have to save my uterus. If you take it, I cannot go back to my village. My husband will throw me out. Even if he doesn't want to, his mother will make him. I will die. I need to give baby doctor, please. Please save my uterus. But you're not Yoruba. You're from upriver. Ausa? Yes, but doctor, my husband can only afford one wife. Please help me. Dr. Barnes, notice her nose, her lips, not one of us. Now, in Nigeria, people stay on their land. They can tra trace their families back hundreds, if not thousands of years. So with rivers and mountains, natural barriers, very distinct tribes evolved. Nigeria has more than 250 and though not as pronounced as, say, the differences between Nubians and Pygmies, the major tribes, Yoruba, Hausa, Fulani, and Igbo, look different with different languages and different customs. Everyone, except me, can peg each patient's tribe and origin. There's not enough to share with her kind. See how yellow and tender, ruptured uterus, we should take it out, but no, she wants to keep it. So oh, we saw it up and come now. Let's see who gets the antibiotics today. Mm. I understand limited resources, triage, tough calls on priority allocation. We don't like to call it rationing, but that's what it becomes. Like COVID ICU choices. One ventilator left. 40 year old father of school age kids or 70 year old from a nursing home. 38 year old quadriplegic or previously healthy 60 year old. But we have ethics committees to help us with those choices. And our shortage of ventilators isn't because they fell off the truck. Of course, some of those choices our healthcare system itself makes. Look at New York City COVID death rates, overwhelmed public hospitals versus the private. And in every decision, there's bias, implicit or explicit. In the US, 13% of the population is black, but only 5% of physicians are. Studies show white doctors give less pain medication less often to blacks, believing either we don't feel pain or we're malingering to get drugs. Black patients presenting with signs of stroke, heart attack, infection, less likely to be admitted, get timely care or appropriately tailored interventions. Black women are three to four times more likely to die in pregnancy and childbirth regardless of education, socioeconomic status. Even our royalty. Take Serena Williams, history of embolus, which is blood clots in her lungs, which can cause sudden death. The day after her daughter is born, she gets short of breath, assumes it's another embolus, asks for a CT scan and blood thinners. Her nurse insists the pain medication must have her confused. Maybe she got an adequate dose. Her doctor agrees to do an ultrasound of her legs. Now, most often, lung clots do migrate from the legs. But if you're short of breath, they're already in your lungs. Leg ultrasound, negative. Precious time wasted. Yet, she persisted. Her lung CT shows clots, and finally, she gets what she needs the heparin she asked for. To our Lagos hospital, only the lucky arrive by taxi or car. Most walk, some for days, and some 
too weak to walk, bump along unpaved dirt roads in wheelbarrows, pushed for days by heartbroken, no longer fathers to be. Many times I pass a waiting area to see a squatting woman deliver her own baby, 10 others in the same little tent, laboring silently. That house a lady? We repair her uterus. 10 days later, no antibiotics, fever abated, she leaves, walking upriver, empty armed and alone. Her dead baby so decomposed, it was discarded with the medical waste. My ears never caught the nuances of the panoply of Nigerian languages, nor did I learn to speak any. But in 12 weeks, I gradually learned the subtle variations in noses, earlobes, lips, color, dress, and accents separating the tribes, along with the art, customs, and stories of each. My host was Yoruba, a tribe overrepresented in elites due to early conversion to Christianity and instruction in mission schools, historically famed for terracotta busts. But I came to welcome the 6 a.m. call of the Fulani, a traditional herder from the north hawking fresh cheeses and walking the riverbank amongst the Hausa, fresh fish arrayed between their traditional canoes. I plowed the market for red-haired Igbos, creative, bronze workers as early as the ninth century, famed for masks and animals, looking for a take-home prize without the middleman. I confess, I have a soft spot for the evil, perhaps because they're more visually identifiable and discriminated against. Partly a legacy of preferential treatment by the British colonial government. But in the hospital, other than being sensitive to cultural differences to tailor care, what place is there for ethnic distinction? Patients are all supplicants, waiting for whatever relief or cure we can deliver, all deserving our best, bound by our Hippocratic oath. I will follow my profession's ethical principles and my own dedication to virtue. I will provide care free from judgment and prejudice. Colonials exploit differences to control. Supremacists to protect their status and power. But competent health care is a basic human right. Tribalism and racism have no place. Diane. I've been so looking forward to meeting you. Ah, bright eyes, eager face, lighter skin than I. Interesting scent. So nice to have another, mm, shall I say, expat. Come. He maneuvers me towards a brown-skinned tennis player looking guy. Eh, a bayo. May I introduce Dr. Barnes? Dr. Barnes. <laughs> but you must have a Christian name. Um, Diane, nice to meet you. Gallant, cute, but obviously expecting me to be bowled over. <laughs> Diane, still enchanted. Ellen, you letting our American friend go thirsty. That won't do. Come, Diane, let's get you a drink. No, you can't take her away. I'm on hostess juice. Then, Diane, what can I bring? Champagne or local supplies? Oh, not another pepper drink. Um, champagne, please. Thank you. Your wish is my command. Don't entertain another soul while I'm gone. Helen, I'm counting on you. A tuxedoed elderly butler threads the crowd with hors d'oeuvres. That's different. My host and all the others I've visited have little house slaves as young as seven, placed by their village families and locked outside in the chicken coop or shed overnight. Maybe in a penthouse you upgrade. 
Or maybe he worked for the parents and now the grown kids. Diane, do you have any idea how many men are interested in you? <laughs> in her pale pink shift, blonde poof afro, Ellen is quite the contrast to the full-bodied women in bold African prints and head get wraps. Yes, I'm looking more like her, despite my Balinese culture. And you don't have to worry. Man gets you, you will be the only wife. Guaranteed. They wouldn't think of taking another. Oh, I'm a writer. My first bestseller was a doomed second wife story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you're Nigerian. I guess so now. My mother was Nigerian. My father, well, you know how that goes. But I grew up in England, where my mother went for school. So how are you finding Nigeria? Um, well, uh, ah, Lagos Island, maternity hospital. Oh, I can only imagine. Careful, Diane. Any criticism undermines your host. Yeah, it's crazy, but incredible experience. <laughs> I'll bet. But you wouldn't have to deliver there. That is not where we go. Look, Lagos can be a bit rough at first, settling in. I knew more about what I was getting into when I moved here, but you could do really well here, you know? Doctor, judge, import, export. <laughs> Are they trying to pick me up? Is that what this is about? You are the top of the food chain here. Well, actually, we are, but I'm all set. Uh oh, looks like Abeo will have a hard time getting back over here. Come on, let me introduce you. Swells and glitterati. Every country, it's the same. Mm. In New York City, you could pick these folks out, skin and dress notwithstanding. Not much different from Dalton School. The same assurance the same entitlement bordering on arrogance, every gesture, telegraphing status and money, demanding deference, expecting homage. A portly guy in full on African dress sashays through the crowd. If there's a macho version of sachet, he has got it down. <laughs> ah, that's Bella Adumadru, Mercedes dealerships. Three! Interested? Yeah. <laughs> Dozens of eyes look over drinks, follow him, clock his gaze, then back to him. Hips turn, chests protrude, and lips pout, as seemingly in unison the women drop their gonads in his wake. Mm -hmm. Likely they all arrived in air-conditioned, chauffeur-driven Mercedes, as did I. Mm. Does it bother any of them that the drivers never slow down for the old folks who hobble across the road on one homemade crutch or speed up at the sight of raggedy, snot-nosed, hungry-looking children? Despite the giant picture windows, the room is closing in on me. Sweet as Ellen is, much as I need a friend, and seductive as being top of the heap might seem, there's a world of hurt these people cause to which they're totally oblivious. I need to get out of here. Being an invisible person of color in a Pan Am 747 piano bar winging homeward never looked so attractive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Looks like all of you are Americans, aren't you? Come to Nigeria to visit the motherland, haven't you? Ah, ah, motherland. Ah, will I show you how you left? From right here, the point of no return. We're standing on the beach facing the Gulf of Guinea, beyond stretch 6,000 miles of Atlantic Ocean. My last tourist stop in Lagos, the first time all summer I've seen a group of black Americans. <laughs> I 
you see? Ah, all this for you. Ah, ankles, wrists, and neck. Think you can run with this? Ha, you're lucky to walk. This is how you American left your mother Africa. Ha, in chains. Want to try one? No? No one? Um, yeah, I, I just like to feel the weight. Very heavy. Yes. Yes. Very. You don't seem sorry. Or ashamed. Sorry? You expect sorry? Ah, I proud. You are losers. The weak. We had wars. You lose. We sell you. Ah, no sorry. We Nigerians. We strong. You Americans. Ah, you weak ones. Losers. Ah, best you be gone. And no, she did not call me on me ball. I remember, long after I was a very little girl, a virus swept across the whole world. Well, I'll never forget the look on my bartender's face as he sang his last call and said there'd be no more happy hours. Not <laughs> for a long, long while. And for months, I stayed in my pajamas and watched the whole world appear on Zoom. <laughs> and as I stared at me, staring back from the screen, I said to myself, is that all there is to a plague? <laughs> is that all there is? If that's all there is, my friends, then let's keep dancing. Let's break out the boo and have a ball if that's all there And I uh, wanted to give another round of thanks to our performers tonight, Sharon Eberhardt, Ibelang Hohitsile, and A.D. Abbott, and Diane Barnes. And thank you all very much for coming tonight. Uh, and come back and check out what the Marsh is doing very soon. Thanks a lot.